Hi, Christian Young here from Impress Solutions. The purpose of this quick training is to walk through the amendments to the Queensland mining legislation in specific relation to uh, critical controls. So background, there was a large amendment bill passed in 12th of June 2024, had a number of different parameters within it. Also covers coal mining legislation and the mining and quarrying legislation. And I'm going to talk and focus on the aspects around critical controls. So there are several amendments and you've got 12 months to comply with these amendments. And I'm going to walk through each, each of the changes or updates and what you need to do about it. <clears throat> so the first one here, the legislation now gives a definition of a material unwanted event. So... And interestingly, starting that again, is it doesn't refer to principal hazards. So it says each organisation needs to work out what's their threshold that then warrants the highest level of attention. And uh, two, two things here essentially saying the same thing. This is a coal mining extract. This is the mining quarrying extract. So what do you need to do? One, you need to make sure you have a definition of a material unwanted event or a material risk, critical risk problem primary unwanted event, whatever it might be, and ensure the definition lives somewhere in your safety health management system, it could be in the risk management procedure, critical risk management procedure, and it's equal to or more rigorous than that is that's provided here in the legislation. So that's the wording. The other aspect to you actually need to execute this. So you need to work out, and this is from our, our training course, what is your materiality criteria, your materiality threshold above which will require more attention and any events or material risk, material unwanted events that meet that threshold, they will now require critical controls. So this <coughs> definition of a critical control, something you're probably familiar with, it's now in the legislation, never previously it was, and we know that we need critical controls for all material unwanted events. So similarly, you need to have this definition somewhere in your SHMS or your risk management procedure Sorry, your critical risk management procedure or risk management procedure, making sure it's equal to or greater than this. And in our opinion, um, yes, the ICMM is a good starting point. That was in 2016. Now we're in potentially uh, eight years beyond that. What we're seeing, what good looks like, is that your critical control selection process considers the effectiveness of a control. So in theory, or in reality, we, we don't want to accept critical controls that have low effectiveness because they're not going to give considering that they're independent of other controls on their same pathway. This is what you unpack in the bow tie analysis and in and of itself is the control specific, measurable and auditable. So is it the way it's worded and defined? Could you audit that or could anyone audit that? Sometimes critical controls don't make it even past that. Okay, the next one here, so we start, apart from moving on from the definitions, we're now getting into some tactical things. So one is around talking to, must be within the risk management framework, again, coal mining here, metalliferous underneath. So as in critical controls need to be in the risk management framework. So what does that look like? So update your risk management framework to include critical controls. So most organizations would have something like this. There's a visual representation. I'm sure there'd be words in and around that. So including that, well, critical controls and material unwanted events or your version of it is woven into that uh, framework. <clears throat> and when it gets to the wording, uh, we're suggesting at a minimum that there's a call out of material risks, critical controls in their definitions, how and when are they identified and potentially some roles and responsibilities and how are they monitored as well. That's a key aspect which you'll see uh, well, that's important. Well, one, it's important, but how this helps with respect to the legislative requirements as well. So we'd expect all of that to be defined within the risk management uh, framework. <clears throat> Safety and health management system. So we can see here it's saying that critical controls must be included within the SHMS. Now, this is one where we advise some caution. So one, obviously, we want to update the SHMS to include critical controls. But in our view, we don't want to try and boil the ocean. We don't want to have critical controls scattered everywhere and then you lose control of what's written in what document and it gets out of sync. So our suggestion to the clients we work with is develop a register of material risks and critical controls and that could just be as simple as an Excel document that's a controlled document that's locked down and then 
your SHMS documentation, be it, say, for example, here it's an SOP, points to that register. So the register can continue to be updated in real time as risk profile changes, but the SOPs, which we know take a longer review cycle, don't need to be done in the same frequency. So that's our suggestion on that. Now, this one is coal mining specific. However, this is very similar. So this is a specific type of document, a paid type of document within the safety and health management system and the exact same uh, suggestion from our end as well. Have the register have the, and then have a link to that um, to ena enable that real-time update. Um, so offices of corporations, I had to get my head around this. Um, so it's been it's a term that's been there before um, or already within the legislation. Now they're just tying in that these offices need to be we can see it here, need to receive information, um, you know, hazards, incidents, risks, which now includes receiving and considering information regarding critical controls. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you haven't already, for this one, do an assessment or identification to work out who are officers of corporation. So there is kind of a little bit of wording within the legislation. So one, if the, if the corporation has an obligation, underneath the act, then it's likely that there's a corporation and then within that work out, well, who's an officer? And the officers are not those that report directly or indirectly to an SSC. So my take on it, these are roles that are off-site roles. Yeah, non-site non based roles could be in group, corporate, governance, boards, things like that, coal mine operator level, potentially coal mine holder level, all of those sorts of things there. That's in the coal mining speak anyway. So identify who it is, identify how you're going to monitor and report on the health of critical controls, and that's a whole piece in and of itself. And then how will you get this information to these officers? For us, uh, a simple starting point could be, if you already do a monthly health and safety report, then just add in critical control information to that and ensure that that health and safety report is then circulated to these officers and demonstrate that. Okay, so that's the key changes potentially it's a lot potentially it's a little depending where your organization is at so how you do it like we've talked to yourself i mean you can do it or if you need help then there's a few mechanisms that we offer so one that that we do that actually is pretty busy is around we have like a free free 15 minute call where we just have a chat what's the biggest issue what's the pain point oh this is how you might be able to solve that and then literally move on another thing that we do and run regularly is we now have master classes in critical risk management off to the right hand side here you can see some of the reviews from our most recent one and that's normally at three levels so people that establish and maintain so they build the critical risk management process manage it monitor it evolve it that's a two-day course for them one for risk owners and control owners there's a three quarters of a day course for them and then supervisors there's a couple of hours course as well so they, they all have different roles and how they apply their roles in the critical risk management process. <coughs> Excuse me, <clears throat> getting over some man flu. Well, the third one, which some of our clients do, is say, look, can you, can you help us? Yeah, I can see you can train us, but can you give us some help as well? And we have three layers and levels of that. So one is purely an advisory service where, okay, you just do some stuff, and then we have some stop points, some touch points, quality checks and deliverables prior to review and then post review. That's so pretty, pretty much a hands off. You come to us and we help you as needed. A second one, which is a bit more involved is where we hold hands and do it together. We do some stuff, you do some stuff. Uh, for example, we might draft some deliverables, then you take it to your site and then you take it through to completion. And the last one, which is more intensive, but is completely, the time frame is far more compressed, is we do it for you where we actually do all of the legwork and you guys just join in as required. A few different ways you can contact us on the email address and also we'll send you a follow up email. There's a little audit tool as well, which I'd like to share with you that can help you on this journey. So thank you for listening. I'm sure this has been of value and looking forward to speaking to you soon. Okay, cheers. Bye bye.